From the beginning of time, humans have tried to heal themselves with ritual and prayer and with whatever nature provided. Through thousands of years of trial and error, formal systems of health care developed, systems based on foods, herbs, and other natural remedies. These systems live side by side with what we call Western medicine. Western medicine has been an enormous benefit in helping to conquer devastating infections and perfecting surgical procedures. But there is more to medicine than doctors and hospitals, and that's exactly what we'll explore this week on A Better Way to Health. Hello, I'm Stuart Scheip, a registered pharmacist, acupuncture physician, and Chinese herbalist. I'm your host this week. We make no effort to recommend or to judge, only offer that you explore a theory that good medicine comes in many forms. So let's get started. Phone lines are open for you for questions, comments, or experiences about your health. Let's hear from you. I am so glad to be with you again on another show. Thank you very much, folks, for tuning in to A Better Way to Health. I'm Dr. Stuart Scheip. Hopefully this show is going to change somebody's life as I try to do every single week. One person hearing the data that I provide on the show may ultimately lead to a healing experience, which is why I got into medicine, especially national medicine, over the last 22 years. Thank you very much for being with us today. So we always try and pick a topic of interest that I would have mostly for my ladies that is mostly um, tend to be very, very common and discuss problems in why, if they have an issue, why they haven't been able to find a result or a healing for that. And a lot of times we have amazing biomedical uh, Western medicine treatments that can resolve problems uh, fairly quickly too with surgery. And we're gonna talk a little bit about one of those issues uh, today, but sometimes it just doesn't. It doesn't resolve the problem. You continue on with the symptoms and boy, you're just, you're just kind of done. You're just fed up with having to take medications or, or if you don't want to take the drugs, then what ends up happening is you just learn to live, quote, live with it, right? Who wants to live with problems when you can get rid of them? The, the issue with so many uh, disorders that I see in my practice when I see people is that there's, there's two main obstacles that the individual has. One is Sometimes the obstacle to realize that the issue that they're having isn't healthy, isn't normal. And this is very, very common with so many people thinking that the bloating and the gas, doesn't everyone have gas? Doesn't everyone get bloating? Doesn't everyone get headaches? Doesn't everyone have problems sleeping every once in a while? Doesn't everyone have neck and shoulder problems or lower back? It's just the way things are. And I tell you, no, because then I would be saying to you, oh my gosh, I'm not, I'm not healthy. I don't have uh, neck and shoulder pain or digestive problems, or I'm not, I'm sleeping at night. That must be bad. That, that's, that's crazy, right? But the whole point is to acknowledge that the body isn't functioning adequately or optimally. The second one is if we do know that, and we know that we're not operating effectively, albeit that we're getting through the day, I can, I hear these comments then, I can live with it, it's not too bad, it doesn't bother me, I'm strong, I just blow right through it. Yeah, of course, but you know, the problem is the symptoms don't usually get any better, they usually get worse. So that's issue number two, is you know you have an issue or you know have a problem, but you're not want, willing to do anything about it. You're not willing to, uh, to have that treated or have that process uh, improved. Those are, two, those are two biggest obstacles that most people face in getting care, especially, and it's not either just Chinese medicine or natural medicine, it's Western medicine too. I have a lot of individuals that come in and say, Dr. Scheib, I do not want to take anything. I'm not going to take any of those chemicals. I'm not going to take any drugs. I'm not going to have the surgical procedure. And, and I know that I've got the issue, but it's not too bad. And I'm just going to live with it. I was like, well, the problem is that's going to catch up with you as well. And the Chinese have always said, why wait till the weapons, uh, why wait till the battle's already begun to forge the weapons or to dig a well after you're already thirsty? It's kind of too late. And what we're going to talk about today, I know you're dying to learn <laughs> all we're going to talk about today, but what we're going to talk about, discuss is that this imbalance occurs over years and years, and sometimes it occurs without symptom. But man, when you get the symptom, when it finally comes, which in America, we really think that symptoms are the very first stage of an imbalance, like we're healthy, and then we have symptoms, and then we're not healthy anymore. <laughs> no, not, not at all, actually. Factually, 
we start malfunctioning for sometimes many, many, many years. Our body is an amazing compensatory mechanism that tries to always maintain what they call homeostasis, maintain this balance in the environment, in its event environment. And despite what we're trying to do to it, the body tries to maintain a sense of, of stabilized sickness, if I could say it that way, but we literally start losing this optimum function. And when the Chinese say the energy or the blood becomes stuck or stagnant, we've already fallen from health. This could be things like bloating. This could be indigestion, not getting a good night's sleep, not having hot hands, or warm hands and warm feet, not having a cool face and chest, not having a good bowel movement every single day, uh, appetite that's off. All of these are variants of that function, actually a malfunctioning of the body, and it's already exposing that to us. By the time we get to symptomology, things have really gotten bad. And that's when you have people that, that just miraculously, they might have a little bit of back problem. They go in for an X-ray or an MRI more likely. And the MRI all of a sudden demonstrates, wow, you've got a tumor on your kidney and it's cancerous. And now you've got three months to live or whatever. So they never knew they had the problem. I've, I've seen Diabetics in my practice that never knew they had diabetes rooted that out. You know, cancer issues, hypertension, never knew they had high blood pressure until they had it checked out in some way. So this functioning is also really, really important um, to maintain balance over long periods of time over years. So what I wanted to talk about today is gallstones. Oh my gosh. You know, and most why do I not see a lot of gallstones in my practice? You'd think I'd be swarmed with people because after I get done showing you this or uh, telling you this data today, this information, you're like, oh, like the VA commercial. Oh, I could have had the VA. Oh, I could have had acupuncture, Chinese herbal medicine, didn't have to go through all of that hassle and all that problem. But the reason I don't is because more than 300,000, uh, well, that's the least estimate, probably I would think even closer to getting up to half of a million people, but for sure 300,000 was the last stat I seen. Gallbladders are removed each year in the United States due to the presence of gallstones. And when you look at 20 million people, 20% of the women, women and 8% of men over the age of 40 have gallstones. They don't know it, but they have gallstones that are pending that are in the gallbladder waiting to come out. But the problem is they've developed such a size, they're not coming out fairly easily. And when you really look at why do gallstones occur, we're gonna go kind of go through a selective process, first of all, of, of what this problem is, what problems does it cause, and then finally get to the therapeutics about how can we resolve it? How do we test it? How can we do this naturally? Or how can we do it fairly quickly? And I'm not the expert in doing um, gallstone removals for sure, um, but we'll talk a little bit about that and tell you about some of the potential gains and some definitely what is not often told you is some of the apparent risks of having your gallbladder taken out for sure. So, you know, when we say that a lot of people in the United States, uh, more than half a million maybe, um, have had surgery, I mean, uh, have had stones, gallstone. Um, these gallbladders really are, are pretty resilient. Uh, the most common triggers for this, for gallbladder attacks are things like caffeine or chocolate or some of your higher cholesterol products, eggs or dairy products, especially ice cream and greasy or deep fried foods. But if you think that it's, that gallstone formation is only limited to those individuals that are obese or overweight, or maybe that um, have a high diet of, of cholesterol or of fatty, fatty foods or, or fat, you're actually mistaken because it pretty much can occur in any individual. There are so many risk factors for the development of that. But man, when you get this start of these symptoms like upper right uh, quadrant abdominal discomfort. So when you're looking down at your feet and you go to the right side, right tucked up underneath your rib cage there is the liver and the gallbladder. And so when that area starts becoming achy, associated sometimes with things like chest pain or neck pain, back pain, um, you may actually have the very first start 
not a full-blown gallbladder attack, but that gallbladder is letting you know that it's not operating optimally. And the most treatment, uh, the most common treatment for that is, of course, surgery. 10% though of patients that come out of surgery uh, with stones have gallstones still remaining in the bile duct. And the bile duct is what actually goes from, we have a common bile duct coming from the liver, dumping all that cholesterol, bile, bile salts that's been manufactured in the liver and coming down that common bile tract and the gallbladder is an offshoot. It has a little um, kind of called the bile duct that actually dumps into this common bile duct and comes out into the digestive system near the duodenal area or the duodenum the upper portion of the small intestine. So when we do eat fats or we have foods that are high in a fat content, that cholesterol with its bile releasing that, secreting that into the upper portion of the small intestine helps what we call emulsify fats or breaks down fat. So you can see if you're eating a fairly large fat diet and most gallbladder attacks usually will occur after a large meal, you're eating a lot of fats and the, and the gallbladder can't take care of that emulsification process. Then we have a whole cascade of problems that start developing like rancidity and putrefaction and fermentation and all these byproducts of inadequate digestion start to occur. But if we're trying to limit this conversation to just fats, it would kind of make sense that if we can't break down fats, we're going to have problems anyway. Um, so the complications of laparos uh, laparoscopy which is laparoscopy is, is the process of using a lot of these robotics, new surgical robotics tools, cholecystectomy. And this cholecystectomy is kind of a, um, it's where they literally will go in robotically and they can snip and remove the gallbladder and take it right out of the body. Now, the complications are rarely infrequent, but you can have things like bleeding or infection, uh, developing pneumonia, blood clots, heart problems, and maybe even unintended injury uh, can occur to adjust adjacent structures like the common bile duct or the duodenum. So if that happens, you might even have bile that uh, leaks out into the abdominal area from the, from the tubular channels that lead, you know, from the liver to the intestine. But anyway, so there's complications. It's not just simply, I'm just going to have my gallbladder taken up, but a lot of individuals do. Before that, a common treatment plan might be in conventional medicine, try and dissolve the stones. There's Chenix, there's Actigol, there's MTBE. There's a lot of medications that are designed to try and dissolve the gallstones so we don't literally have to take out the gallbladder. Here's the issue that I hear even from some of the physicians that I've talked to in Western medicine is the fact they say, by the time we get it, by a surgeon, by the time we get it, the gallbladder is just about ready to fall apart or dissolve or it's so infected or it's so inflamed you, you lose the option, you lose the choice about just trying to resolve the stones. And a lot of people, like I said, if your first symptom is a gallbladder attack, you may be in trouble because if that gallstone, which has increased in size over a period of time, has gotten so large that it can't leave the gallbladder, and maybe if it has left the gallbladder, it is so large that it gets trapped in that common bile duct. Now you got problems. Now you're looking at instantaneous surgery because you're going to have backup bile uh, back up into the liver. You're going to start having liver congestion, uh, infection develop, and it has to come out. That's way, that's water way beyond the bridge that we should have never ventured down because we're not actually finding out if the function of the gallbladder in the liver is in perfect balance. And the Chinese have ways to detect that way years before you start having gallbladder issues or the risk of having to have it removed. But the drugs, they even only work on smaller cholesterol stones and they can cause things like diarrhea or liver injuries, or they raise the plasma levels of cholesterol really high. You can get nausea, pain, fever. There's a lot of stuff that could be complications too from medication therapy. So that's not always a win-win. A major concern, like I said, is if the stone becomes too big, it, it can get stuck on the way up. So traditional Chinese medicine, we have a couple of, of great things, and we'll, we'll come back to this um, over and over again. But traditional Chinese medicine uses a lot of great herbs that tend to dissolve and to soften crushed stones. Now, you're going to say, well, then why hasn't that hit the Western market? 
Why don't we know about that in Western medicine? If this is such a great treatment, why don't we just get these herbs and use these herbs for people with gallstones? The problem with it is that they crush and soften the stones so they come out very, very slowly. Well, who wants to wait months and months for gallbladder treatment or even for that matter, years and years? You know, that's not the American way. I want it done now. I want the problem resolved immediately and I don't want to wait around for it. So Chinese medicine, in order to have this happen, does have to have some time. And that takes a relatively long time for these stones to start getting smaller. The beautiful thing is there's no side effects. And there's another treatment even, which is amazing, called moxibustion. And moxibustion in Chinese, or, or shortened, the language is moxa, is a type of herb that can be um, smoldered, I guess is, a, is the best word. We ignite the moxa, almost like wool, and it does smolder. It generates an intense amount of energy. The Chinese call that qi or yang qi, heat. And by doing that over the liver gallbladder, just similarly, we're not going to talk about kidney stones to a great depth today, but if you're looking at probably having gallstones, you should probably check the kidney because they usually form pretty much in, in the same realm in the same time. That uh, we can use a moxer to dilate that common bile tract to release that stone and let the stone flow freely into the digestive system. So there's specific protocols. And if we have time at the end of the show, I'll, I'll give you the protocols on the beginning of intestinal cleaning. And I know there's a lot of people that have already, that are into the holistic medicine view and say, I know all about the mixing with like uh, lemon juice or some sort of uh, citric juice and clay and using psyllium and, and using olive oil. I'm, I, I refrain from giving a lot of the specifics because people, if they do have gallstones that they've already recognized or had diagnosed, and they're in that transition period about what to do, I'm telling you folks, if you do this, these type of cleansings on your own, it can be some danger involved in that. Danger meaning that if you do not know what you're doing and you flush a lot of stones, especially bigger stones in that common bile tract, you not, might not have the option, even if with my support of continuing to do natural remedies to try and release that stone, you may be on your way to the hospital to have that stone removed through removal of the gallbladder because a lot of docs will not just take the stones or lithotripsy, which is a procedure of like uh, ultrasound, uh, using ultrasound to kind of like break up through vibrational energy, break up the stones in the, the gallbladder. They might not do that. It's just easy. Just take the gallbladder out. Stones come out with problem solved, right? Problem is here I get people after they've had their gallbladder out into my office seeking care for what? For recurrent reflux, nausea, you know, diarrhea. And I was like, wow, that really looks like a gallbladder issue. Yeah, well, it can't be because I had my gallbladder out is the response. And I was like, so sad for you because... You don't have a program in the body. There's not a button you push on the body that says reprogram our strategic balance between liver, gallbladder, kidneys, restructure that because now we no longer have a gallbladder. Your body still thinks it has a gallbladder that's not functioning adequately. And thank goodness they can't take the gallbladder meridian or the energy channel out of the body in Chinese medicine because it's physically not there, but it's a way that we can still access gallbladder function, even if the gallbladder is not there. And I know that's even sometimes hard to believe. You've heard amazing stories probably of amputees. I've had a couple in my career of coming in and not having maybe a, they had a below knee amputation on the right foot. And they said, Dr. Scheich, my right toe is killing me. And I was like, your right toe, sir, you don't have a right toe. And they're like, I'm telling you, my right toe, they call it phantom pain. And using the meridian system still in Chinese medicine, you can resolve that issue. You can resolve the pain. Same thing with the gallbladders. We actually have a meridian that goes directly to the gallbladder. And if you really want to know if there's potentially stone formation or you have an inflamed gallbladder, there's actually a gallbladder point, a specific acupuncture point on the gallbladder meridian that will release that gallstone. 
or actually tell me by pressing on it and significant response from the recipient of that pressure that, whoa, that's extremely sensitive and that's really powerful. What did you just hit? It just, hit, just like put a poker pain on my point. I was like, nope, I just pushed it. So there's a lot of ways diagnostically that Chinese medicine using the tongue, using the pulse, using the eyes, using the ears, using the meridian system that we can actually diagnose if you have gallbladder issues years before Western medicine will even find a gallstone developing in your gallbladder. Because see, gallstones don't just develop as big gallstones. They develop as what we would call grit or gravel. Very, very tiny little fragments of cholesterol and bile salts that have become hypersaturated and develop into crystallization. So at that point, you've already fallen from balance and the gallbladder will already start sending out its signaling that it's not healthy and it needs support or it needs recovery. Uh, there, are, there are many uh, guides. There's probably make your head spin as far as many protocols that I've even come across as far, far as flushing procedures. But I will say that when the gallbladder problems exist, the gallbladder can't contract efficiently. And that starts developing problems because there's stones, even if you are fairly proficient at clearing stones, you have to know that there's protocols and procedures that maybe the stones from the front of the gallbladder nearest the common bile duct will come out first, but you may have stones from the back area of the gallbladder that will either one, move slowly forward or two, actually become stuck or stagnant. And those have to be loosened. So there's a time space, almost like a pulsed dosing therapy uh, that we have with things like intestinal microbes or parasites where we have to have multiple treatments over set intervals to kind of promote this function back to optimal, uh, optimal levels. And that could be, oh my gosh, three flushes, four flushes. That could be repeated monthly. That could be repeated weekly. That could be repeated a couple of months later. So there's a lot of different protocols that have to be followed. And, and how do I judge which protocol? The individual sitting in front of me. What's most likely to be the best treatment for them? Because if you start applying gallbladder flushes to everyone, you're going to start running into problems. I mean, even some individuals using, how do you use Epsom salts? How do you use Chinese bitters? How do you use liver, uh, liver supp supplements or liver support? Because if you've got gallbladder inflammation and you may have neck, shoulder pains, upper back pains and thinking, there was a review article I read um, about an individual that had an automobile accident and, and hurt his neck, cervical area, you know, bulging disc for years. And then ultimately it started getting worse and worse and worse and found out that it was gallstones. So the Chinese physician started treating with um, gallbladder procedures to resolve that. And the pain got less and less and less in the neck and shoulders to the point the pain was almost subsided. Now, the problem was that was masked because this gentleman had a motor vehicle accident. So don't always take it for granted that just because you have this set of symptoms, that it has to be like, in this case, a motor vehicle accident. Actually, in that case, it may have been the initial trigger for the worsening of problems in the neck and shoulder. But the original reason this dude had gallstones years before the car accident even occurred. So there are protocols and there's good flush, flushing procedures. You may want to consider thinking about detoxing or decongesting the liver at the same time, since the liver and gallbladder in Chinese medicine are sister and brother, they're definitely related. Um, liver congestion, uh, gallbladder congestion leads to liver congestion. Liver, when the liver is congestion, nutrients, herbs aren't working as much. Uh, the people have congested livers can't flush out their stones very well. Another problem is the bile produced in the liver through some people use olive oil to stimulate that flowing down the gallbladder in order to push the stones out. If you have a congested liver, even the lemon juice or the grapefruit juice or some of these other products that are using to help move the flow is not gonna work because you've still got a congested liver in the way. So we are going to take a short break so I can recoup 
and uh, and actually uh, nourish my throat from talking so much. But certainly, if you've got issues, you've had a gallbladder out, uh, you have questions about the gallbladder, give our office a call and let us have uh, get some help, some information from that. That's seven seven two three nine eight four five five zero or online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. We'll be right back with you. I'm Dr. Stuart Scheib on A Better Way to Help. You're listening to A Better Way to Help with me, Dr. Stuart Scheib, lead physician at Women's Traditional Chinese Healing. To book your consultation, please call 772-398-4550 or book online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. Ladies, your time has come. No longer will you be a slave to drugs, sleeping pills to put you out, caffeine to wake you up, pills to ease your pain, hormones to regulate your cycle, addictive drugs to calm your anxiety, and antidepressants to lift your mood. Find the root cause of your imbalance and quit treating only the symptoms. You deserve so much more out of life. Women's Traditional Chinese Healing was created for you. Welcome to A Better Way to Help. Our experienced physicians listen to your concerns and formulate an individualized treatment approach to bring you back into balance. We specialize in women's natural health care. When was the last time you really felt amazing? If you don't remember, let us help you refresh your memory. I invite you to contact our office for a consultation with our physicians to determine if you are a good candidate for what we have to offer. Call 772-398-4550 or online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. That's 772-398-4550 or traditionalchinesehealing.com. Thanks for listening to A Better Way to Health. I'm Dr. Stuart Scheib, founder and lead physician at Women's Traditional Chinese Healing. We're a unique natural healing haven for women of all ages. Like many women today, you might feel like you're battling your body, struggling with fatigue, headaches, sleeplessness, pain, hormonal imbalances, digestive issues, allergies, and those few stubborn pounds you've put on. Western medicine often ignores the root cause of your symptoms, but at Women's Traditional Chinese Healing, we work together to get to the source of your symptoms and bring your body's function back so that you feel energized, comfortable, and balanced. If you're wondering if my practice is a good fit for you, I invite you to book a consultation by calling 772-398-4550 or online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. Again, that's 772-398-4550 or online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. This is A Better Way to Health with Dr. Stuart Scheib of Women's Traditional Chinese Healing. Get back to living by booking your consultation at 772-398-4550 or online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. All right, we are back to A Better Way to Health. Thank you very much, folks, for tuning in and staying with us here as we discuss how to get rid of gallstones and how to look at um, this gallbladder liver uh, balance years in advance to try and prevent the formation of the stones. You know, I uh, gave you probably a very short uh, a stint about symptoms, you know, gallstone or gallbladder problems when we first began. I probably should, you know, elaborate, uh, elaborate on that as well. Um, you know, gallstones can be, they are a chemical disturbance, faulty diet, liver sluggish, liver toxicity, gallbladder stagnation, or bile stagnation is a result of a, of a sluggish liver. But some of the risk factors that I didn't go over included things like sex, maybe four to one over women over men, which is pretty significant for development of gallstones. Actually, it's two to four times greater in women than in men. So although women are thought to be predisposed to gallstones because either increased cholesterol synthesis or suppression of the bile acids by estrogens, pregnancy, oral contraceptives, they can all uh, cause elevated, even elevated uh, estrogen levels can greatly increase the incidence of gallstones. So look, ladies, if you have that going on, taking oral contraceptives, uh, pregnancy, like I said, or uh, taking estrogen, bioidentical hormone therapy, you may be more likely to development of cholesterol. You know, what's kind of interesting is how everything kind of comes together. Uh, when I look at issues 
uh, relating to liver and gallbladder. And what I mean by that is that if we know that the problem with gallstones is this super saturation of cholesterol and bile salts coming out of the liver, that's where they're manufactured, but get stored in the bile. If we're bile super saturated, then one of the, the things that we should start thinking about is how do we not only get the bile out in Western medicine, in, um, in herbal medicine, we would call that a cholagogue, an herb that would help move the bile out of the gallbladder into the intestine. And there's, there's a couple of great ones, you know, globarda choke, nettles, dandelion, um, are all good herbs that can help with that. Beet leaves, uh, beet greens, uh, so I said, and also uh, um, uh, radish, Spanish black radish, great ways to try and start moving this bile. But once the bile is out in the intestinal system, here's a problem is that bile is reabsorbed, 90, 95% of all secreted bile is reabsorbed in the, the later end of the small intestine before it goes into the large intestine. And that goes into the portal system, which is a, a blood system that returns blood from the intestines back to the liver again. So if bile is being reabsorbed and the liver is actually still manufacturing bile, we have bile overload. And one of the things, I'll just lay that on the table really quickly, is we need to start thinking about how we can increase fiber, which would be pretty much the number one treatment strategy naturally, is Americans just don't put down enough fiber in their foods. And there's a ton of fiber in green leafy veggies. Well, they're not eating a lot of green leafy veggies. There's a lot of fiber in fruits. They're not eating a lot of fruits. And when you start eating a diet highly processed, you're really stripping out a lot of the fiber, even with breads and cereals, very, very little fiber because they're not whole anymore. The bran and the germ are, have been removed from a lot of these grains. So that's the very first thing to start thinking about is if I get the bile out, I got to get it out, out. It has to be defecated out. And that usually fiber is a great medium at which traps that psyllium works really, really well. There's a, a bunch of, of beautiful natural fibers of bile and uh, sequester bile so that it moves out of the digestive system. Now, there's drugs like that too, bile sequestering agents, they call them. And, uh, but, oh my gosh, why would I need, why would I put another drug in a body when I can do it so beautifully and so naturally with a simple herb or simple nutrition? So this is another comment that is kind of off the cuff, but I do want to bring this out. A lot of individuals come to me for high cholesterol high LDL, low HDL levels, and high triglyceride levels. The triglycerides, hands down, they're pretty, pretty destructive to the, the blood vessels. And uh, hands down, they're actually an inflammatory uh, possibility in and of itself. But that's a whole nother discussion, even with blood sugar. What I wanted to talk about is the cholesterol. So if the liver is responsible for maintaining a balance of cholesterol levels in the body, and you have high cholesterol level, that means the body is not shutting down the mechanism, right? For continually producing cholesterol, bile and bile salts. There's something that's stopping that trigger from uh, shutting that, uh, that metabolism down. Oh my gosh, that could be a lot of chemicals, food additives, emulsifiers, MSG. There's a lot of different products that will cause that signaling to go awry. But if the body's not breaking that down, people come to me and say, Dr. Scheip, how can I get my, my cholesterol, my LDL levels down? Uh, because I know it's causing damage and, and I'm going to be placed on a statin drug. And the only thing a statin drug really does, to tell you the truth, it just really shuts down the manufacture of cholesterol by stopping that enzyme that actually creates that to happen. Yeah, there's a better way. So if you've got a blockage or a buildup, uh, even to the extent of a thrombus, they call this atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic heart disease, where the vessels are becoming sclerosed or weakened because you have this hyper cholesterol uh, flow in the body and it literally has built a blockage in the vessel. Start thinking about how could I naturally, if it builds itself, can't it just dissolve itself as well? Yeah, well, Western medicine doesn't do this. They go in and sometimes it's necessary to remove that blockage and put in a stent. But I start thinking about things like, yes, of course, how can you start the dissolution process? See, bile is fairly insoluble in a water medium. It's, it's in a, an oily medium that it does a very good job in a fat medium. So in order to uh, 
to have bile soluble enough to get it out of the system, we have to use things like bile salts, phosphatidylcholine, or and a big part of that is lecithin, right? Lecithin I use from soybeans, more organic soybeans have a ton of lecithin. And then you can get it more water liking or actually try and get out into the system more water soluble. So either A, we have to increase the cholesterol secretion, get it, getting it to secrete out of the gallbladder, decrease the bile acids or decrease the lecithin secretion. Now, what ends up happening is I use lecithin to start breaking up that, that uh, obstruction in the vessel. And folks, at six months, eight months, don't think that you're going to do that in a week. It takes a while. And all the while, we have to strengthen the blood vessel underneath the clot because that area has been so much inflammation that you could literally have a rupture, an aneurysm develop once you start dissolving this clot. Got to be careful with that, right? So we start that first. We start strengthening the wall using a lot of herbs with rutin, a lot of uh, astringing type herbs, and then we apply the lecithin. And now you've got your physician is going to freak out because they're going to take your cholesterol level. It's going to be 400 or 500 during this therapy. And they're like, holy cow, you know, we definitely need to get you on a med. That's not the issue. The issue is we're naturally creating that. So now we've got to go back to the liver and the gallbladder. And how can we pull this? How can we get this, these bile salts moving, not only from the liver, and the gallbladder? You see how this is a whole process. But now you've got this bile into the intestinal tract that you have to sequester and bind to get it out of the system. So you've got major systems working here. You've got to support the kidney system. You've got to support the liver. You have to support the gallbladder. And you have to literally take care of the acute problem, which is a decreased blood flow in the arteries or in the vessels, mostly the arteries where they've got the problems with those. So there's a lot of moving pieces. It's not just so easy. Oh, just take a drug, take a statin drug and, and lower the cholesterol level. It doesn't solve anything. The, the race problem, we even have problems like Native American women over the age of 30. Nearly 70% of this group have gallstones in, in contrast to like 10% of black women over 30 have gallstones. So the difference in rates among different ethnic and different genetic groups also reflects the extent of cholesterol saturation of bile. And now we're starting to see that even in biomedicine or Western medicine, where we now are able to identify so many liver enzyme systems that may be down uh, genetically because they're not operating, they're not operating efficiently because of a genetic issue. So yeah, we've got a lot of great tools, just kind of the, the treatment strategy is a little bit screwed up or a little bit messed up still. You might have gastrointestinal issues that are that are causing you more grief. Like there's a lot of problems with 98, another stat I've seen, 98% of the bile acids that are secreted during digestion being reabsorbed. That's higher than I even had in my other studies I was looking at. 98, I was thinking 90, 95% is that things like Crohn's disease or cystic fibrosis or irritable bowel syndromes or leaky gut syndromes or problems with... Uh, uh, fat or legumes, FODMAP type of diet uh, approaches, is you're going to have a lot of inflammation already in the gut, which may impair uh, your ability to sequester these bile salts. Drugs, we already mentioned, oral contraceptives, drugs high in estrogen um, can, be, uh, can be problematic as far as increased levels of cholesterol. And then as we get older, of course, the average patient for gallstones, 40 to 50 years old, and as we get uh, higher with age, of course, the gallstone incidence uh, gets higher and higher as well. It probably takes about eight years from the time, from a couple of millimeters, maybe one to two millimeters, where we can finally pick them up on either an ultrasound. That's kind of old school. We're using CT now. Pick up that uh, gallstone in its infancy and start treatment right away. The problem is over that probably about average of eight years period of time, this stone gets big. And they can get like centimeters, you know, 10 millimeters into one centimeter. And when you get stones that big, they ain't coming out. You literally, you may move stones fairly easily in the millimeter range, but when they start getting into the centimeter range, pretty big stones, and that's where you have to be a little bit more um, relatively aggressive with conservation, not to cause problems. Like I said, getting something stuck in that uh, bile tract. So silent gallstones are 
uh, are a real problem is a lot of elective gallbladder surgery is really not warranted. These are silent problems. You know, they're silent, meaning there's people are symptom free. They have gallstones, but they're not having symptoms. And there is a maybe a chance of developing symptoms, maybe 10 percent maybe at five years, 15%, the stat at 10 years or 18% at 15 years. But if you look at the controllable risk factors, you can't control your age, you can't control significant or severe obesity. Because as you lose weight, I, I told you initially that it's not always people that are obese, but as you lose weight, your bile becomes more and more saturated. So especially with a fairly quick weight loss, I've seen some of these stuff on television where they're losing like 40 pounds in a month or it's very dangerous folks to be losing that much uh, weight at, very quickly. One is it's a reset mechanisms of the body. You didn't get that way just in a matter of one month. And so healthy weight loss, I know no one's going to like that when I say that, but a pound to two pounds a week, very, very healthy weight loss. And when you start drastically uh, doing things to your body, it will revolt. And in many ways, that's the last thing you want is really kidney stones or gallstones to develop when you're trying to get your body back and help. Dietary fiber, you know, in, in population studies, gallstones are definitely associated with the Western diet. So we have a high refined carbohydrate diet. We got high fat, low fiber, and that leads to a reduction in, in the synthesis of bile, bile acids by the liver and lower bile acid concentration in the gallbladder. Not, not really good stuff when you're looking at trying to prevent the formation of gallstones. So the other thing that we can kind of think of is if we're not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, vegetables like the pectin and the oat bran and the guar gums and some of these products, apples are amazing. You know, there's actually an apple gallbladder flush of, of using apple, the juice from the apple that can be very, very effective. The malic acid in apples in high, high concentrations can also dissolve gallstones. Interestingly, diets rich in legumes like beans with high concentrations of fiber is associated with an increased risk for gallstone. So, so you don't want to make the problem worse by eating foods that may be contributing to that. And if you really look at things like uh, the Chileans, uh, the Pima Indians, other North American Indians have high prevalence rates for cholesterol and gallstones because they've got a diet rich in legumes and beans. So we should really curtail that in individuals that already have gallstones, right? That would be a no-no as far as on your diet list. The opposite, a vegetarian diet has actually shown to be protective against gallstone formation. So albeit that uh, I'm not a huge promoter all the time of vegans and vegetarian diet, it's definitely so individualized discussing nutrition with someone is what's their constitution like? If they're very, very cold energetically, cold hands, cold feet, hypothyroid issues, uh, clear urine, gaining weight, eh, eating a very cold diet, like a, like a lot of salads or a lot of raw vegetables, probably not the right diet for this type of a constitution. Animal protein, especially those from the casein proteins from dairy products has been shown to increase the formation of gallstones, especially in animals, while vegetable proteins like soy were preventative of gun skull stone. And albeit that I'm not a big fan of soy, I'm a wonderful fan of soy if you can tell me it's non-GMO and organic. Because 90, I don't know, last maybe statistic, 90, 95% of all soy seeds in the United States controlled by Monsanto, soybean that, you know, when you're eating, when you're literally using sterile seeds and you have to buy them every year from Monsanto as a farmer, the likelihood that you're going to spend a lot more money to try and use organic farming is unlikely. So most of the soy in the United States is genetically manipulated and uh, highly allergenic. I see a lot of these uh, tests coming back, food sensitivity tests like IgG levels showing sensitivity to soy and wheat because of these, um, uh, this type of problem genetically modifying our foods. High intake of refined sugar, risk factor for gallstones, and uh, caloric restriction. So even people with gallstones that tend to consume a lot of calories, as a result of the increased in intake of sugar in women and fat in men, that causes problems as well. So a low glycemic diet is recommended for most individuals, either whether you're starting uh, 
to handle blood sugar or you want to start for weight loss or increase energy, it's always a good idea to get processed foods out of the diet and start to uh, trend toward more like a Mediterranean diet or a lower glycemic diet. Coffee induces gallbladder contraction. So if you already got gallstones, it's probably best to avoid coffee until the gallstones are, res are resolved. And coffee, chocolate, spicy foods, a drug called theophylline, all weaken what we call the sphincter, the stomach sphincter, the cardiac sphincter, that's right at the end of the, the mouth tube, the esophagus that goes in the stomach, it weakens that. And what's most of the symptom of gallbladder issues? People have reflux or indigestion, bloating, gas, neck and shoulder uh, pains. Those are all insomnia, headaches. These are all gallbladder symptoms. And it doesn't really matter if the coffee is decaffeinated. And I said, why, do, why is that going on? And I kind of look at coffee. If you pour a cup of coffee and kind of get down and look at the surface level of the coffee, you're going to see there's kind of a film floating on the coffee. That's an oil. And if I guess if Juan Carlo were to make green coffee bean tea, you know, and take the coffee beans right off the plant, smash them, put boiling hot water over them and kind of steep coffee tea, I, I guess I wouldn't have a problem with that natural oils. But when you start roasting things and, and letting the oils uh, exposed to oxygen for enough period of time or sunlight, you start rancidifying those oils. So Coffee then turns into a rancidified beverage, an oily rancidified beverage. And I don't know if that's too healthy for the liver uh, function. And I, like it says, it doesn't even matter if there's cleft of the caffeine. So caffeine might not be a big player, but certainly in the stomach, it could be. And a low lecithin concentration in the bile uh, may be a causative factor for a lot of individuals with gallstones. So so studies actually shown that taking as little as 100 milligrams of lecithin three times a day will increase the concentration of lecithin in the bile, while larger doses produce even greater effects. And if you got lecithin going on, now you got dissolution or breaking up of these bile, bile salts and, and uh, bile uh, causing the, the, the gallbladder liver to be better secretors of this bile into the intestinal system. And then nutrient deficiencies. You never think of this stuff. Vitamin E, vitamin C uh, have been shown to cause gallstones in some experimental in animals. So vitamin C supplementation actually shown to produce positive effects on bile composition. And it's a great antioxidant, but it's not ascorbic acid. So when I say, I mentioned this multiple times on shows is that vitamin C 500 milligrams is not natural. It's not the whole vitamin C product. It's not the whole vitamin of vitamin C. You're kind of just getting ascorbic acid. You're kind of just getting the banana peel and you ain't getting the banana. And I really have you get the whole banana. So when you're using high, high doses of vitamin C or synthetic vitamin E and not using natural whole forms of these vitamins, you may have trouble in other realms. Now, of course, fish liver oil supplementation has been shown to be a benefit. You think, well, that's a fat. That should probably make problems worse. The thing is that a lot of these diets high in uh, 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 omega-3 fatty acids and these really beautiful oils are anti-inflammatory in nature as well. So you get more of a benefit than just a uh, protective effect against gallstones. So there's other stuff. I mean, there's so many great Chinese herbal medicines and uh, like I had mentioned, milk thistle is amazing for the liver, probably the king of the liver herbs or queen, if you want to use it in that direction. Uh, dandelion and artichokes and turmeric and, and boldo. These are some of the herbal choleratics that offer the greatest benefit as far as moving bile, bile salts, cholesterol out of the liver, helping the hepatocyte, helping the actual liver cell recover its function and regain function. That's the amazing activity of milk thistle. It actually helps at an energetic level, uh, starts helping that cell take a dead liver cell and turn it back on. It's the only, only herb that I know of in all of my apothecary that I know can actually do that in a liver cell is take a dead liver cell and turn it back on. So then you've got uh, a lot of, I'm not going to go back and mention uh, stuff that we've already had in Western medicine, but the dissolution of gallstones is really the way to go. Sunbathing, a study of 206 white-skinned individuals, since we're in Florida, people who like to sunbathe had twice the risk of getting gallstones than those who did not like to sunbathe. 
the association was almost entirely restricted to those who always burn after long sunburning, sunbathing. Again, I think this might be maybe a genetic predisposition. Maybe that might be a Northern European or European descent where we might have uh, you know, a higher level. I, I'm not, I didn't dive into it that deep. But listen, the whole point, folks, is that there's a ton of stuff that can be done naturally to help you before you have problems. But the only way that you need, you know that you need help is if you get your body checked out. So get your body checked out. Either call my office, 772-398-4550, or literally online at traditionalchinesehealing.com and literally uh, get you in for a consultation. If it has to be virtual, I'll do it virtual for you if you can't make it to the office here. And let's go through some of these risk factors and let me hear your story. If your story looks like there may be something brewing, gallbladder, liver issues, kidney issues, I'll tell you directly. And I was like, I think this is a good opportunity for you. And I think natural medicine might be your answer. If I hear the story otherwise, that you're having acute attacks, it may be referrals to the Western biomedical physician for evaluation in that department. So always, you got to check out what's going on. And if you don't really understand your body's function, as I described it today, let me educate you. Let me show you how the system is supposed to function so that really when, it, when you start having symptomology, you're not thinking, oh, I have neck pain or shoulder pain and oh, maybe good massage or, or maybe good as an adjustment. The problem is, is that all those are great therapies. They're not going to really resolve the problem if you've got other stuff found diagnostically from a Chinese doctor using the pulse, using the tongue, using the ears, using the eyes, using nonverbal signs to make the diagnosis as well about what might be going on in your body. Your body is an amazing diagnostic tool. and It is screaming what's wrong with it. It's unfortunate you may not have the right person reading those literally cries for help. But if you are one that has had gallbladder issues in the past, still have your gallbladder and want an effective treatment strategy, oh, you're in the right place listening to this show at this time. If you're looking to prevent gallstones, you're at the right place at the right time because you do not want them even developing. Like I told you, the silent ones that we talked about before. So get in and get that consultation. It's easy. Just click on, I want a consultation on the website. Women's Traditional Chinese Healing is my practice online at traditionalchinesehealing.com. Or you can call us 772-398-4550. Hope you got the information that you needed today. I hope you have an amazing week coming up. I'm Dr. Stuart Scheidt. Loved presenting today with you. We'll see you next week on A Better Way to Health. Thanks for listening to A Better Way to Health. Discover health, wellness, and healing by booking your consultation with Dr. Scheib. Call 772-398-4550 or book online at traditionalchinesehealing.com.